minus one minute. First meeting you, Bikita, and uh, he's trusted me uh, uh, with responsibility within the movement, uh, sending me all the way 3,000 kilometers to Lusaka, Zambia to uh, help push a church forward. Uh, I'm honored to call him a mentor. Um, I'm honored to call him my pastor and uh, the papa of this house. So uh, I want us to all stand up on our feet and honor this amazing vessel. The Papa of the House, let's honor Pastor Muredi Wanjao. Rocky, thank you so much. Thank you so, so much. God bless you. Uh, please be seated. Um, is everybody in? Everybody outside, you need to come in. Uh, there's good things happening in the house. Yeah. Do you guys have good times in the networks? Yeah, I think I always go to the best networks. So today, today <laughs> so yesterday, yesterday it was life free, but today I was with downtown, and those guys are smoking. They're the campus of the day. So, <laughs> but yeah, what a great, great time. And again, it's just so good to have the Worship Harvest team uh, just sharing wisdom. I think whenever you guys speak, something just clicks for us. So thank you. Uh, Pastor Jeremy and B34, yes, the words you said, uh, they'll stay with me. Um, yeah, um, wasn't Apostle, Mo uh, Apostle Mokisa amazing, Apostle Mose? Yeah, always amazing. Um, he lost me at, how many people do you have in your church? How many full-time staff? How many part-time staff? How many people, anybody like me just got lost at that point? Like, my mind stopped working. I was like, okay, Lord, what are you saying? Like, I was just like, call me forward. I'll come in tears and repentance and just pray. But I was telling the downtown team that one of the things that I really was processing is just my own sense of my goodness. Uh, we have such a power-packed Ferrari here in Mavuno Church. We have such a power-packed Ferrari here in Mavuno Church. It's such a powerful vehicle that God has given us that we are using to drive to Navas and back for shopping. You have a Lamborghini and all you're doing is driving it on a rough road and bringing, it ba bringing back groceries. Uh, we've not understood what God has called us to. Look at your neighbor because I'm talking about them. Yeah? I'm talking about them. Does your neighbor look like somebody who could lead a church of 3,000? No, 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 don't, 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 don't hype them. Don't make them feel good. This is not feel good time. Like, let's be honest. Let's, let's, let's like, if it's not true, you can say maybe not yet, but I believe by God's power they can be. Does your neighbor look like somebody who can lead a church of 3,000? That was a bit more muted. <laughs> Yeah? Let me just ask you, let me ask you to do something. Do me a favor, okay? Do me a favor. Just speak a word into your neighbor right now. Just tell them what you see in them. Tell them I see in you. Tell them what you see.
What do they see? Yeah? Awesome. Awesome. You need to see yourself as God sees you. You need to see yourself as God sees you. Are you with me? Everybody here? Let me do what I see the hype men do. If you're with me, clap once. All right. That just means Pastor M wants you to stop talking now. Pay attention. So, so here's the thing, guys. You need to see yourself as God sees you. And I really believe that's what we are being told today. Um, if we don't see ourselves as God sees us, we will live a small life. And yet God is calling us to live a big life. Uh, Apostle Mo, thank you so much for your challenge to pray like at least believers. You know, like at least. At least. Anybody who is ready to pray at least like a believer? Yeah? Anybody who's not sure they can handle an hour? Because I, 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 I mean, it, it's good to be honest. Huh? Some of us, maybe you've never done it. Uh, and it's just going to be a stretch for you to think of. But you gave us such practical tips. Um, have some music. Set your, la- set your timer. Uh, find a nice time and place. Did you say walk around? Because I, I see you walking around. <laughs> so, so Apostle Mo has given me this story before. But the other day I woke up at Isaac House, where we are staying. And I found the man praying. And I said, how dare he outpray me in my own house? How? How does a guy come to your house and pray more than you? So, so I, I'm happy to say that today when he came out, I was there praying. <laughs> I'm like, seriously? Follow, follow, follow. Yeah? So tomorrow, tomorrow I'll find you. <laughs> So I really, I mean, it's not a competition. I think it's just being challenged spiritually. Guys, we have, how do you have a mediocre prayer life and then expect to see things happening in your church or in your life? It can't happen. And so I think I'm so challenged. And I think what he's really saying, because the whole context of this is discipleship, remember. So the whole idea is, what will you reproduce? What's going to happen is that every one of us is going to be leading the future of the movement. God will entrust you with people who you, all of us are going to be raising giants. The problem is dwarfs can't raise giants, yeah? So if you're not at the place where your own faith is growing, where your own prayer is growing, where your own heart is on fire, then you can't raise people who are like that, yeah? Because you'll reproduce after your own kind. Now, nobody's saying you have to be an apostle like Apostle Mo to be able to raise giants. All you have to do is be the best you. Be the person God has called you to be. And then tell people, follow me as I'm following Christ. Because it's not, it's, it's, it, you know, it's, not, it's never follow me. It never stops there. It's as I'm following Christ. And so I think this is what we are saying. We want every single one of us to understand this is a new season. It's a new season. Uh, Today as we prayed and I just said, I have committed. (laughs) I'm going to pray like a believer. Uh, I've not been praying like a believer. I know that you're shocked, some of you. Uh, I've been praying like, not not like a pastor or not even like a believer. Um, I think I'm one of those guys who, because I'm in so many, I'm I'm, I'm in all these Bible reading things. So when I wake up early, I usually spend like the first 45 minutes just doing my different Bible things. Then after that, I'm like, my goodness, time has gone. So I might even pray for 15 minutes after that just to summarize my hour. Then I say I've been up an hour. Today I was challenged. I was like, oh my gosh. So it means I just have to wake up an hour earlier to make sure I do get my prayer. So I shared this and then one of my pastors, I don't know if I should reveal who they are. One of my pastors says, well, God has really been speaking to me in this season. I've just been waking up at 2 and praying till 5. I said, oh, what is this? <laughs> I, w- I wouldn't name them. I wouldn't name them because I don't want to embarrass them. <laughs> but I said, guys, you might be sleeping. There are people who are not sleeping in this movement. Are you understanding what I'm saying? Some of us are going to sing, sing revival, and then you'll see revival happening over there and it's past you. 
because there are people who are getting this. And I was so challenged uh, by, by my pastor. And I said, okay, at least let me start with that one. But I'm soon coming to become a pastor like my pastor. Uh, I'm soon following my pastor as she follows Christ. So I think, I think for us, let's, let's not take this stuff as entertainment. This is not. This is God positioning us. Have you heard about the upper room? This is the upper room. Uh, the conversations we're having are upper room conversations. This is how you begin to post posture yourself for the Holy Spirit to do what He wants to do in us. So I'm going to just um, um, <laughs> share. I think what I've been just doing is sharing some of the things we've been discussing with the exec team um, in, in, in recent times. And so the first thing I'm going to do is just ask um, if you could, if, if, you're, if you're in two, just tell your neighbor the mission of Mavuno Church. One of you only says it. Just say it real quick. Make sure they're getting it, huh? Make sure they're getting it right. Okay. If you're still saying it, it means you're not getting it right, okay? Because you should have finished. All right. Other neighbor, tell them the vision of Mavuno Church. Okay, then this is a fun part. This is a fun part. The first person, the first neighbor. <laughs> Man, I've missed being able to say, tell your neighbor. Neighbor. All right. Tell your neighbor. <laughs> if you could actually, the first person, if you could in like one and a half minutes, explain to them the strategy of Mavuno Church. You can use your notebook and just draw that out. Just real quick, one and a half minutes, so don't, don't waste time. Just jump right into it. Sketch it out to them and explain to them how, how Mavuno makes disciples. Anybody finished? Anybody finished or finishing? Pastor Njero's done. Well done, Pastor Njero. Good job. Oh, great. Excellent. Well done. Anybody else finished? You guys are still talking. People after my own heart. The worship harvest team is finished. Can you believe it? As Mavu Knights are still doing it. Oh, you guys are finished. Well done. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Well done. Correct them, huh? By the way, if they're finished, correct them. Where they made a mistake, at least just tell them, here, you could have said this. Or here is something you missed out. Here's a little step you missed out. Awesome. One of the reasons we, we talk about this is because it's so important for us to understand why we're here, um, what God uniquely called us as a, as a church to do, 
And that, that's what these things help us begin to define. Huh? So, mission of Mavuno Church, turning ordinary people into fearless influencers of society. I love it. I love it. Our, mission, our vision of Mavuno Church, plant a culture-defining church in every African capital city and the gateway cities of the world by 2035. Come on, give it up for our worship harvest team. They actually know that. So impressive. So those are the things that we stand for. That's what God has called us to. And we said our mission talks about our passions, passion for the lost, passion for transformation, passion for societal change. The reason we do our vision is because churches are the vehicle that God has chosen to use uh, to bring about that transformation. Uh, without the church, then the world, <laughs> Jesus says, I'll build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail. So without, without the church as the vehicle, the tool, this discipleship will not happen. So that's why those things are in our, in our vision. That, that's why those are the things we talk about. Now, let, let, me, sh let me just uh, talk a bit about uh, this transformation loop, uh, this strategy, because as we've been doing this whole conversation, it's very easy for someone to feel like, are we now moving into something completely different? Has something shifted? Are we now talking discipleship and before we were talking about fearless influences? Are we now doing something completely different? And I think I want, as we've talked about that as a team, uh, we, we actually have made a few tweaks on it. And the reason we made them is because we thought we want to clarify the language. There's nothing that, we don't want to change it, but we want to clarify the language. So if you could just put that up. Uh, this is kind of like, I don't know if you can see it very clearly, uh, but we're going to make sure it, it gets sent out to you. So basically, world. God, God, God loved uh, the world. That's why he gave. So we start with the world. And then we always say, as we start with the world, we want to bring people into a place where they begin to identify. They begin to be part of the gathering of God's people. And so those are our rich events. And so we started changing some of the language, and we use the words reach, resource, release. Uh, and we talked about the fact that there's, so as you can see, it's the same, it's the same diagram. There's just a, little, a few wording things that we've, we've tweaked. Uh, there's the outreach, uh, the need-based outreach we've always talked about, and there's different things that fit there. That, the, some of the things we write in those, in small letters, they're not as important because they're really tools, and tools change every season. But what they do is, the whole idea of them is, how do you get, start to get people into the gathering? Pastor, uh, Apostle Mose talked about the fact that evangelism is an important thing. By the way, I'm hoping we'll have time to go through the pev... pev <laughs> I hope we'll get a chance to go through the whole of it, because I really am curious. Because I think what uh, Apostle Mose is teaching us is, as you become a movement, some things become important. And some of these things were not important to Worship Harvest Church. But to the movement, they become very, very important. And so I'm hoping we can understand the thinking. And I, it's obvious prayer is important, isn't it? If you want to be a movement, you, you can be a great... I, I suspect you can be a great church without prayer because sometimes strategies can create churches. But movement? Let me tell you, there's no movement without prayer. No movement of the gospel. You look at your history. People have even started churches without too much prayer. But movement is another level altogether. Um, so... So outreach is important. Then we get people into gathering. We've put kind of like, like some broken lines on our gathering. And the reason is before it used to be a solid line because it was, <laughs> we used to call that the controlled space and we called it services. And then we realized COVID was beautiful because it told you what is a service? What is that? You know? Um, when, so it means that when the, the church cannot meet because the government has said you can't have a service, it means that the transformation loop cannot happen. And Mavuno cannot turn ordinary people into fearless influencers. So let's wait for the government to tell us when to continue. And of course, that's ridiculous. And so we began to realize, no, we, cannot, we can no longer have that as a control space with a hard line. And it's not even services because it, it began to happen in many ways. It, it, was, it was in homes uh, as people were gathering. It was in, 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 on Zoom. Uh, it, was on diff it was in such different forums. So we just said it's the gathering. It's how do you bring people into a gathering of God's people. And we're saying the loop is how you bring somebody from ordinary and move them into the fearless influencer. And the first place, we're, we're saying how do they begin to get into a space where they identify with God's people. Now, this loop is not necessarily always linear. Sometimes people will jump that step and get into a, uh, the next step before they get there. But generally, this is kind of how it works. Uh, and then once they're in that gathering and they're beginning to engage, we've, we've had a tool that we've used. 
and it's called Mizizi. And it's one of the tools, like I said, it's a tool for this season. But it's a, it's a tool that helps people begin to understand what it means to be a community. So you're, 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 you're walking with people in your community, you're engaging with those people in your church. How do you begin to then, then uh, have them understand, what, ha- have the same language, have the same uh, thinking, have the same connection with, with, with everybody else? And Mizizi has been a great tool because it teaches us the rhythms of discipleship. It teaches us who is a disciple. Uh, a disciple is somebody who prays. A disciple is somebody who impacts their community. A disciple is somebody who shares the gospel. A disciple is somebody who gives. A disciple, so it, it teaches you those rhythms uh, of discipleship. And so that's one of the tools we use to start communities. However, it's not the only tool. So again, even this, doc, even this diagram as we are going along, this is what it looks like now. I hope it will look like this, something close to this next year. But what we're saying is it's in, it's in flux. Uh, now, we used to say life groups there. That's the most significant shift. When I, let me give some background. When I left Nairobi Chapel to come to plant Mavuno Church, we had what we called ecclesia groups. Some of you have never even heard of that because uh, it's a long time ago. And these groups were gathering groups. They were like fellowship groups. They were like people just would meet, study any book they want, uh, it was a way of just keeping, in my view, and I, I want to say this humbly because I was actually the pastor in charge of them for a long time, uh, they were a way to keep Christians busy. <laughs> so it was like, let's gather. At least we know if you're together, you won't get into too much trouble. Uh, so the leader can figure out, do you guys want to study Revelation? Okay, you guys study Revelation. You guys can download the book of James. So everybody would did, did what they wanted. And the groups were really about uh, being, being in that space where they were learning together. When we began Mavuno Church we realized that's not going to work uh, because we felt that God is calling us to walk in one direction. Now, I had moved from Nairobi Chapel with a group of people that came with me, and they were in ecclesia groups, and they loved the ecclesia groups. So I realized I'm not going to change these ecclesia groups. So instead, what we did is we took our first uh, group of, of new people in the church. We took them through Mizizi, and they were so on fire for God because now they had the same language, they understood. I mean, the Ecclesia group really didn't shape how you thought about church. So people would have different language. They'd come with different church traditions. This caused us all to have the same language. We all were thinking the same. We had just one group that graduated. That group had 30 people. The first group I ever took through Mizizi, they were so on fire for God that the church actually felt them. We had, we had a church of about 300 by that time, adults. And the church felt this 30. They were 10th of the church, but they had energy. And then we had them facilitate the next group. And then somehow we decided we're not going to call these guys Ecclesia Group because if we do, we mess them up. They'll start looking around to see what do Ecclesia Groups do. And what we say is actually life groups do not just do what they want. We will actually be studying the Word of God that God gave the, uh, the, the team that's leading. So whatever is preached on Sunday, the life group would discuss that uh, during the life group meeting. So, so that was a big shift. But I knew that if I tried to kill Ecclesia Groups, I would... I'd lose most of the church at that time, most of the, 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 the believers before they became disciples. So what we decided to do is to actually start life groups while the, while the ecclesia groups were in church. So we would have life group meeting, but not for ecclesia groups. <laughs> you guys just keep meeting. But what happened is as people got excited about what was going on, as they did Mizizi, we'd get them into a life group. They'd form such good relationships they'd now stop going to the ecclesia groups because they're like, the, co- the quality is so different. And in the process, slowly we just began to see the ecclesia groups begin to disintegrate. Slowly people lost interest in them. I never killed ecclesia groups. They just died a natural death. And in time, every group in our church was a life group. Now, here's the thing. Our life groups are fantastic for a church. They're not what a mission, uh, 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 they're not what a movement needs. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Because our life groups, they're still fellowship groups. Even though they meet around the world and around the vision of the church, they are very fellowship-oriented. Uh, any of you ever tried to tell a life group it's time to divide so that you can start other groups? <laughs> uh-huh, I can see I touched a live wire there. <laughs> I can see pastors breaking into sweat right now. Like, I know my life groups. Uh-huh. So... My thought is, we're not going to break up the life groups. Bless the Lord for life groups. They've, they've done a good job. I thank God for them. Uh, I'm not going to try and break the life groups. What we're going to do instead is begin something new. 
something that this season is calling for. And we see them as discipleship communities. Yeah. And discipleship communities are really, <laughs> you guys call you as missional communities. It's really similar. Because what we're saying is they're based around discipleship and mission. And so what are the changes there? It means that when I disciple, when I'm, the, when I'm the leader of a discipleship community, I'm not a facilitator. In Mavuno, we use the word facilitator. Facilitator is somebody who just helps yeah. make sure things happen. But for us, the leader of a discipleship community is the discipler. They're actually the pastor for those people. So what we're saying is, by the time I, you're in charge of one, you're actually one of the pastoral team of our church. <laughs> Uh, you, and you're responsible. You're actually responsible for the lives of those people to shape the life of Christ in them. That you actually will be praying for them. You will be held accountable for them. You will know their names. Uh, you will be re responsible to make sure that they are growing in faith. You'll be responsible to make sure that they are tithing because that's part of their growing in faith. You'll be responsible to visit them at work if you need to, to understand where they work and to pray for their businesses as they start. That you are actually a pastor. So that is a shift, isn't it? That's a huge shift. Now, some of you would be tempted to go to your church, or maybe you won't, and just announce from today, no more life group meetings. We're starting discipleship communities. Let me guarantee you it will fail. Don't clap. It will fail. Because your church, <laughs> you already had some of the experienced pastors breaking into sweat when they, when they contemplate such a thing. So here's how we, 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 how we are doing it. So for me and my, and my, my, my executive team, they're my discipleship community, by the way. I'm pouring into them. I'm shaping Christ in them. They have a team. And you saw, I showed you the numbers yesterday. Yeah. Remember the, the chart yeah. that we copied from Worship Harvest? <laughs> we followed from Worship Harvest. So that chart basically showed you Pastor Njoro, and it showed you his, his, his network, and showed you Pastor Angie. I think it's Pastor Angie's we looked at. And you saw here the names. Here are strategic team members. Here are her people. She's going to shape those people and pour into them and disciple them. Those people who she's pouring into will be the key in charge of the life groups of the church, the discipleship communities. Sorry, I'm even using old language. The discipleship communities of the church. So what we are basically saying is, Pastor Njoro is the key leader for discipleship in his church. It's not back in, in, back in the day we employed a discipleship pastor a Mizizi pastor, a life group pastor. We're saying, actually, your lead pastor is a lead life group pastor, yeah. a, a discipleship community pastor. By the way, I think we're going to get to a place where if you say life group, we, you, you, you put money on the table. You just, we fine you. We have to change. We have to, I have to even purge it. You know, when you come up with something and it works so well for many years, it's, it's hard to remove it from your system, but it will get out. So what we're saying is then, uh, Pastor Njoro is actually, the, he's responsible for discipleship in his church. And you know, the thing that we've come to realize for us as the exec team is we were very outreach-driven. And that's why church planting is the first thing in our mission, uh, in our vision. And outreach is a big thing for Mavuno, and I believe it will always be. But what we realize is we are putting the cart before the horse. Outreach is a byproduct of discipleship. It's not the other way around. So we're very keen on let's send out fearless influencers. Let's start front lines. Let's, start, let's, let's get the church doing spread the love and all that good stuff. But if it's not based on discipleship, then what you're doing is actually it's, it's not going to last. And so what we realize is we have to reorganize the church so that discipleship becomes the, the core. Remember we used to say, I think at the time we used to say we are all outreach pastors with sub-skills. We've changed that. Now we are all discipleship pastors with sub-skills. Everything else we do is a sub-skill. Your discipleship pastor who also runs the, the, the PA system. You're the discipleship pastor who also plays drums. Hallelujah. Amen. In, I didn't hear a drama and say amen. You're the discipleship pastor who is also in charge of admin and finance. Amen. That's kind of what, amen, thank you. So this is what God is calling us to enter into, the space where all of us are disciples. So what does that mean? It means you cannot be a staff member if you're not leading a discipleship community. Yeah. I think you're beginning to understand the consequence of this. Huh? And, I, and, I, and as I'm saying this, it might be a bit hard if you've never thought of, of yourself this way. But what we're saying is if we don't do that, then we have leaders who are not disciples and people will follow you. And that means you, they will become you, which means that we're going to raise up 
believers and not disciples. Yeah. So what we're saying is, if you want to be a leader in this movement, then basically it happens through discipleship. Yeah. And the core team around me, so even for me with my executive team, I'm saying you cannot be an executive pastor if I don't see the people you're discipling. Hey. And I need to see that you know their names. I need to understand that you've spent time with them. I need to even be able to ask. I love, I just have, I loved how, <laughs> I, I love how Apmo asks, how many people in your church? I could really see Pastor B3 like, where are my numbers? Where are my numbers? It's like she needs to know those numbers, isn't it? Yeah. yeah, because it's her responsibility and that's her first responsibility in the church is to know how many people she's looking after. Isn't that what Jesus would want? Because he's, he's the good shepherd and he's called us to be shepherds, to look after his people. I might be able to tell you how much money my church is making, how many people came in last Sunday, how many YouTube hits we had, but I can't tell you how many people I'm discipling. I'm that tea factory that is producing one tea bag every year. And I think, that's, I think that the challenge that he's been giving us is something that our hearts have been percolating on. So what we're saying is then we become the pastors of discipleship. We become the leaders of discipleship communities. And every church, so if it's downtown, the discipleship community will come from Pastor Kilonzi's core disciples. And his team will then disciple others. So that every single person in downtown will be connected spiritually, to Pastor Kilonzi. Does that make sense? And if you're his staff member, you are also leading people in his church who you are now leading along the vision that he's pouring into you. Let me give you a little... Let me tell you why this thing is so powerful. How many of you have watched Fearless in the evenings? I've had a chance to watch Fearless, or one of the morning prayers. How many of you have had a chance to, to see that? How many of you have noticed... <laughs> this is now how you... I'm so glad you guys are relatives. I'd be shy to say these things if you're just strangers. We'd have to ask you, just go outside so we can have talks. How many of you have noticed the predominant nationality of the people who are watching and commenting? <laughs> you know, yesterday somebody, somebody commented on, 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 the, on the stream and said, hey, you Ugandans are taking over. But do you understand why that is? And I, I got to understand yesterday as we were sitting in our group with life when Pastor Florence said something randomly. I don't even think she knew what she was saying. Because later I asked her to say it. She had even forgotten what she said. But she, she said that one of the marks of following, because our group, we were all fluffing up. Okay, we are going to follow more. I'm going to follow more. Then, she's, then she and Pastor Steve were asking, what does following mean? What is following? And we, I mean, so she, they gave us some marks of following that I don't want to steal Apostle Mo's thunder because he has to talk to us about that at some point. In the middle of Apef, <laughs> please, please tell us those marks. Eh? Please tell us, please tell us. But anyway, Pastor, Pastor Flores and Steve, they said one of the things that we've taught our people to follow is we've said, you listen to the voice of your shepherd. And so they said, you can't, you can't be listening to Steve Furtick. Actually, they said, Steve, uh, they said uh, to, to uh, Bishop Jakes, more than you're listening to Apostle Mokesa. I say Steve Furtick because for us it's Steve Furtick. He's the other pastor of Avuno Church. <laughs> I know. By the way, I know. I know. I know. I'm very, sec I'm very secure, by the way. I I'm ex It's so true. <laughs> but I'm, I'm, I'm very secure about that. Uh, but the thing about it is, you know, they said you can't be listening to that guy more than your own shepherd. And so one of the things that their people know is when Apostle Mo is speaking, they follow. So guess what happened last night or the first night when I sent, because Pastor Kuria sent us a list, a, a link on the campus pastors group. Um, and so I, say, I, I immediately took the link and sent it to, all of us were supposed to share it with our campuses. And so because I know, uh, I mean, I'm, we're good friends with uh, Apostle Moe and Pastor Ari. I, we have a group, a family group uh, of, the, of, of, of the two couples. Yeah, yeah, we're tight. And it didn't start yesterday, by the way. It's been there for years. Huh? So you have to show how you know people. <laughs> You, who do you know? Anyway, so I, I, I basically shared, <laughs> sorry, that came out badly, but I shared, I shared the link with Apmo, and I had no idea what was going to happen. So guess what the first thing he did? 
he shared it with his exec team in their WhatsApp group. They immediately shared it with their uh, cluster leaders, the, 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 the pastors they oversee, and the, the, the leaders of their location, the, the church they're in, their, their zonal leaders in their churches. Those guys immediately shared it with the next level. Within less than 10 minutes, a thousand people had checked into the YouTube stream. Now, the other thing that they taught us is, when your teacher is teaching, when your leader is teaching, and they're not just talking about Apmo, even when one of their location pastors, or even your discipler, when they're teaching, you don't listen passively. You listen actively. Uh, first of all, you start. <laughs> no. <laughs> they say you listen, you listen actively. And listening actively means you don't just sit there just nodding your head. You have to, you have to actually participate so they know you're there. So that even if nobody else in the room is interested, they know somebody is listening to me. So guess what? The minute, and this is so crazy because now their church has that as such a culture, it wasn't up more speaking, it was me. But the minute I made a point, I just saw, you know those fire yeah, emojis. emojis. I was like, YouTube is on fire. I mean, guys, what, worship harvest guys are like, preach Pastor M, this is awesome. And I'm like, whoa, who are these guys? But you know what it does? It means that any stranger who's watching and was watching indifferently, all of a sudden is like, this is important. Yeah. yeah? So it pulls in the next person. Yeah. And so I think one of the things that I'm saying is, when you see us say we are moving a discipleship, to a, this is, when we say we will influence society, we will impact society, let me tell you, you will sing impact society until the cows come home. If you don't have people who are aligned to impact society, yeah. because what is happening is, worship harvest, you know, they're a culture-defining church. They entered our YouTube stream and they defined it. As in, they defined Mavuno. The culture-defining church was defined by somebody else. We shall revenge. <laughs> yes. They need to feel us at some point. <laughs> so, so what I'm saying is, it, right now, that's, a small, that's just a small thing. It's, it's emojis on fire. A time will come, a time will come when it will be a presidential election being determined. It's coming. And it will, come, it will come from these guys having a prayer meeting and saying, the lack of righteousness in this nation is too much. There is one righteous candidate that nobody cares about. Send the WhatsApp. And a nation will shift because they are doing discipleship. Anybody, anybody read Church Shift by Sandia Delaja? Yes. That's what happened. They turned... Ukraine, they act, the church actually determined the, gener the, the direction of Ukraine simply because the church decided this is the way we are moving. So when you talk about impacting society, it's not happening just by shouting. It's going to happen because we intentionally move in a different direction. Is somebody with me here? So, so this is what we're talking about. So let me go back. Give me, give me my document here. Give me my diagram here. Are you there? Okay. So... So, discipleship communities is what we're about. Now, you can't see the three things under there, so let me tell you what they are. We've always had our three, our different experiences, isn't it? Influence yourself, sorry, influence your family, influence your workplace, influence society. But we, we shifted that and we moved those up there, and I'll explain that about that. So, the three things we have in discipleship community is your discipleship community, your discipleship group. So, so we kind of shifted the language a bit. So worship harvest, please bear with us. And then we have our, our zone, what we used to call our zone. We, we want actually, we actually we, we are, we are toying with using the term missional community for it. And then we have our church plant. So what we're saying is, this part, these three circles is your group, the discipleship community you're mentoring, then the, gr the groups that it's part of, what we've called our zone, let me not confuse with new language for now, and then the church plant that comes out of it. Now, there's a radical shift there. In the past, Mavuno would pray, and Mavuno, I mean this team here, and the people who are part of this team and others. 
And the Lord would reveal some young person who is full of the zeal of the Lord and just is gifted. And we would send Pastor Njaro. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Uh, would, somebody would speak a prophetic word uh, into their life and say, I see in you. I see in you the next leader of this community. I see in you a, a church planter. And then we'd call that person either to come into Discovery or into one of our, our leadership development programs or enter into a relationship that would then be able to call them out to be a campus pastor. And many of our campus pastors, that's how you are called, isn't it? Uh, it's because somebody saw in you uh, potential to lead and called you out. Now, the problem with that is you then had to learn on the job what it means to lead a campus. This is very different. It was great for a church, but it doesn't work for a movement. How this works is we say, okay, uh, where is Nash? Okay, that's Nash over there. So Nash, Nash is part of Pastor Kilonze's team. And so he's leading, he's, he's leading maybe a discipleship community. He's got some people he's now leading. And then Nash, your guys now begin to lead others, isn't it? Because the whole idea of discipleship, maturity is what? Reproduction. Reproduction. So Nash reproduces, and in the next six months, which you can't give Nash three, three years, seriously. I mean, this is Nash we're talking about. So in the next six months, in the next six months, Nash's disciples have, are now discipling. He's on the 25. In the next six months after that, which is by, by this, this time next year, he's already at his 125. And Pastor Kelonzi is already telling him, you've outgrown. The gr there's not enough grass for all our cows in this same place. So at that point... Pastor Kilonzi tells Nash, there's your church. You understand? So, <laughs> all right, Nash, I'm going to be commissioning you next year from this point, huh? So just get ready. So, so, but the point I'm making, here's the point I'm making. Don't miss this point. Here's the point I'm making. The point is that every single member of your church is a potential church planter. Because the problem with our vision and our mission before is that there were two separate things, and we couldn't find a way to connect them. We had this whole vision of turning ordinary people into fearless influencers. Everybody in the church felt that one. Because, like, obviously everyone wants to be a fearless influencer. Then we had this thing of planting culture-defining churches across Africa and the gateway cities of the world, and people were like, that's a good one, but because I'm not a church planter, we'll support, we'll give money, but let's be fearless influencers. So there was a disconnect because the vision is meant to be helping us execute the mission. Yeah. But there was a breakdown somewhere. Now what this does, it brings it together. Because then it means as we are turning ordinary people into fearless influencers through discipleship, everybody is raising up to be a church planter. Yeah. And you don't raise a church planter who has 10 people and call them out to plant a church. Hey. Already, by the way, you will already see people will just rise to the surface. Yeah. You see whose groups are multiplying. You see who has the leadership potential. Some will be slower than others, and that's okay. But it will be very quick where you'll be able to say, okay, here's somebody with 100 already. Their groups have multiplied, and they're doing it. And sometimes it's not even about um, length of service. Uh, I think it was interesting talking to, was it Pastor B3 who has somebody 18 months? Yeah. Like, Pastor B3 has somebody in her church who became a believer in her church 18 months ago. Went through her their version of, you know, the Leadership Academy, uh, her gang. Disciple, disciple. The you know those guys who just go like this? And they just move faster than everybody else. And this person now has reached a place where it was like, okay, we need to plant a church. Pastor B3 has people who've been with her since the beginning of the church and who look like potential church planters. And then there's this 18-month-old in the faith who is a church planter? They're not a potential church planter. They are. Why? Results. Does that make sense? Yeah. So it's no longer about, I've been here long enough. Why aren't they sending me? It's really about, I've multiplied. Yeah. And sometimes you find it's actually somebody who is a housewife, not the CEO. <laughs> you know, it's not about, it's not, it's not even the person who has a theological degree. That person might not even be a multiplier. Uh, it might be somebody who is just a humble person in your church. But you're just going to find that they have the capacity and they're, they're following. Actually, it's going to come as they follow. Because this whole thing has to do with they follow. If they follow, they will multiply. 
And so this is what we're saying. Our discipleship communities then become that. And our idea is everybody in your church is in a group, everybody who's a disciple. Of course, remember, we're not killing our life groups. Now, if you have a, if you have a small congregation and people are very, they love each other and they trust you 100% and it's easy for you to do it, kill them. Uh, use, your, use, your, use your wisdom. Uh, I know that uh, one of our pastors used the COVID experience. I think it was Pastor Angie. Uh, she used the COVID experience to just say, since life groups aren't managing anyway, let's just kill them and organize everybody who was in a life group in a, into a discipleship community and let's just kick off. So for her, almost everybody in her church is already in. Am I saying, guys from South, am I going you know, to testify? Is that true? Yeah. yeah. So South is way ahead because then they just took the whole church, organized everybody, now they are moving. And because guys were in a place of flux, and, and so they took advantage of that. This, you know, sometimes transitions, crises are good for you to do a, a hard transition. So they did that. But if you're not there yet, then the easier way to do it is get your team, you and your staff team and your core team, have the discipleship conversation that we've been learning. Hey, I'm going to shape Christ in you. Spend time with them. Change your job description so you're spending more time with them and you're making sure that you're pouring into them, you're shaping Christ in them. And then ask them to multiply. So they invite people and you can start with the people in your congregation. Start with the people in your worship team. Start with the people in your ministry. Start this, convers- start, start this thing happening. And within six months, within 18 months, your whole church will be in your discipleship trees. So that's kind of where we're heading. And then the rhythms come. Because we said, how do we impact society? That's where the family, the workplace, and the society uh, begin to come. And every year we do rhythms that help us impact. This year we've done family. Has that been amazing? I mean, we've seen such transformation in families. And the idea now is I think we'll be even more effective because I think we'll be moving as one uh, when, when, we're, when, we're, when we're making changes. And so with our rhythms, we're able to impact society. And that's a release part where we start to see movement happening. Churches... Uh, front lines, church plants begin to happen in that space. So I'm not going to go into too much detail because I think you've, you've seen this. We'll send this out. We'll spend a bit more time in our global meetings unpacking this. But I just wanted you to get a glimpse of what this looks like. Uh, I had a chance to speak in a... Let me... I had a chance to speak in a, in a, in a, in a church planting forum uh, not long ago. And I, I shared the history of church planting at Mavuno Church. And it's interesting because God showed me we've gone through three, three seasons of church planting at Mavuno Church. Uh, I just want to conclude with this. And why am I sharing this, guys? I'm sharing this because I think it's important for you to be in the know, isn't it? You're the leaders. You represent this movement. So you need to understand what God is doing in this movement. The first uh, part, the fa- we've worked with three models for church planting or for, more, for, for adding, uh, for increasing uh, and reaching the ends of the earth at Mavuno. The first one was adding churches. We added churches. Uh, and if you remember when we started Mavuno downtown, uh, that was an ad- addition. We sort of had Pastor Kema, we spoke into him, we sent him. Uh, and many of our churches have been planted that way. Uh, we've, we've picked somebody, we've prayed about them. Addis was Pastor BX and Pastor Mugambi, and it's like we, we sent you to start. Uh, so we added churches, and then they picked uh, Pastor Tumim uh, and said, okay, now you lead this. So we added churches. The next phase uh, came because there were problems with that model. The first problem with that model is how expensive it is. I, I'm almost embarrassed to say how much money Mavuno has spent planting the churches we have right now. Uh, when I think about Addis, when I think about Lusaka, when I think about Blanta, when I think about uh, even Berlin, I mean, it's been expensive. It's cost us a lot of money. But beyond that, it's cost us manpower, it's cost us energy, uh, and it wasn't always successful. I mean, we put a lot of money without always any guarantees of success. Uh, and so we, we, at some point, it was obvious we couldn't continue doing it. And many times what would happen is you'd plant the church, but because it's a different culture and you, you went in with all that energy, uh, when things don't work the way you thought, then it ends up becoming, you're not even freed to plant another one because now you have to support that one. So it's a model that really doesn't work well. Uh, so we moved to a different model. We said we're, we're multiplying churches. Uh, we said we're no longer adding churches. We're multiplying churches. This is helpful even for the churches outside Kenya to hear because you might be tempted to add churches. We said, no, 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 we're not going to add churches anymore. It's not a sustainable model. Even if you have money now, trust me, I've had money. <laughs> it's not a good model. 
Uh, so we went to multiplying churches. What is multiplying churches? This is when we began to expect every church we plant to plant other churches. So it stopped being Hill City or uh, Bellevue at the time uh, that was responsible. Pastor M and his team are, are responsible to plant all the churches. We started to say, okay, downtown you have to plant. Uh, uh, Hill City you have to plant. Uh, South you have to plant. And that's where churches like uh, uh, Mavuno uh, Waiyakiwe came from uh, because they were planted, Mavuno Lifeway. They were planted by other churches. And so we began to multiply a lot faster when we did that. And it was a great model because it moved the multiplication uh, much faster. Uh, and, you know, it was interesting because also it was no longer based on one person or one center. It wasn't just Pastor Njoro and me at the center calling out people. It was people were being called out in different places. And so it was a lot more uh, uh, effective. And you know what we also found? It wasn't as expensive. <laughs> uh, it wasn't as expensive. Uh, it was still expensive, but not as expensive. So, so we were able to, to do it a little simpler, and that was helpful. Uh, the expectations were a little lower. Uh, it was still challenging in some ways because, again, it was still resource intensive, and it was still, uh, it's not always easy to get church planters for these bottles. You know, by the time now, Pastor Kelvin has planted, uh, Pastor Kevin has planted Pastor Kelvin. Now, Pastor Kelvin is thinking, who's the next guy I'm multiplying with? He's looking at his team. His team is like, I'm not a planter. Uh, you pick this one. I mean, it takes a while to finally get to the place of multiplication. In this season, God has called us to a completely different model. And it's a model not of adding churches, not of multiplying churches. It's a model of multiplying people. We multiply people. And that is the genius, I believe, of the book of Acts. Um, we realize that we can actually train every single member of our congregation to start a discipleship community. Yeah. Everyone. It's the basic competence for being a Christian. Seriously, just gather some people and pass on what you've learned. That doesn't, anyone can do that. But what also that means is anyone then becomes a potential church planter. Yeah. It's a complete radical shift. Now, remember what Apmo told us. Some of these things will require a dying to self. I think it was, uh, it was Pastor Ondachi. They'll require a dying to self. Because if I'm used to being the one at the pulpit, if I'm used to being the one who's leading and everybody's looking up to me, then it won't work. But if I start to see every single person in my church and I start to draw some people around me and then I see that they can actually draw other people around them, this thing begins to happen. I start to multiply leaders. Now, the interesting thing is the organic reach uh, is way, way faster. Uh, I think uh, Abmo talked to us today about the numbers, so I won't go into the numbers. He showed us just the radical multiplication. And he, he used some very... You know, when I was 20... And I'd be told about discipleship and they start calculating for me after every this many years. I used to say, 30 years is so long. I'll be dead. My God, that is such a slow model. Do you know what? It is now 30 years later. I don't have 9.7 million. Are you understanding? I don't. If I was 20 and I wasn't thinking I was, that people are at 50 almost dead, I would probably have my 9.7 million now. I'd have been patient to do it. But the other crazy thing is this thing is not as slow as we think. No. And what I feel like Worship Harvest, you guys have done, you've actually innovated something that is powerful. I don't know if you know it. Because the navigators have been doing what you're doing for years. Anybody know about the navigators? Anybody been influenced by that? They have been doing it. But because they came from a European parachurch perspective, which is very individual-based. It's me and my disciples. It's not church-located. As a result, it was extremely slow. Because you see now you're starting with, one, with 10 people. The reason you can start with that is because you have a supportive environment of a church around you. <laughs> Pastor Angie didn't ask her people. She just said, come, here are, your, here, are your, here are your five people that you're discipling. Here are your six. You, I think you can manage seven. Here. That's how she did it. So her people already, they didn't even have to hunt. They were, they were told, here are your people. So you, a church can do things that an individual struggles to do. And so what Worship Harvest did is they took this model that Mike Breen, because even Mike Breen has never seen a church grow as fast as Worship Harvest. So it's, sorry, I'm saying that respectfully, but I believe he hasn't. His models are great, but when they're located deep inside a church, and what's what you guys have done? You took them and you customized them for the church. When you take them into your church model and you start to multiply, the numbers are astronomical. So that 9.7 billion is a joke. Actually, these guys are talking about 12,000 disciples in less than a year. 
That's why I think this thing is so exciting. Because what's going to happen is some of the people in our churches, we've, they've gone through Mizizi. They already are tithing. They already know about Jesus. You're not teaching them the basics of the faith. They're already leaders. They were just waiting for direction. You wouldn't have to take a year with them or three years. Just hang out with them for the next three months and they're ready. In fact, for some of Pastor Angie's people, she was like, we're starting together. <laughs> as, I'm, as I'm leading you, you're one week behind with the next person. You can do that in a church. So I, I really believe that's, that's uh, where this is going. And it demystifies church planting. No longer will we have people who say, uh, church planting is for kina pastor so-and-so. Uh, for us, we are fearless influencers. It just removes that dichotomy completely. Yeah. And it helps the person who's working for Barclays, the person who's working in a medical practice, the person who's working in Safaricom as a marketer, everybody begins to understand this is our calling. Yes. Yes. Do, you, do you understand how we've been holding that Ferrari back? And we've been using it to buy vegetables. Yeah. And it's seriously. Guys, listen to me. The people in your church are phenomenal. Yeah. Tonight, you're going to be listening to an interview I did with the guy who's speaking about media. What's the largest media house in this country? It's, okay, now it's Royal Media, yeah? Sorry, wrong question. Okay, not second largest, maybe. I think for the longest... Okay, what's, what's the largest... Let me use this. What's the largest print nation? Huh? Most influential. It's been since, independ since forever. The managing editor. I mean, that's like the most powerful guy in the paper. The managing editor. The guy who actually decides which stories get run. He goes to Pastor Kilonzi's church. He sits in the pews. He loves the church. In fact, I mean, he loves the church. He comes to church every Sunday. When they reopened, as many people stayed home because they weren't sure about church, he's one of the first guys who came with his family. Because he's a believer, he's on fire for Jesus. Guys, we talk about how the media is misleading this country and how they're printing stories that are just all political and just dividing us. The managing editor of the most influential newspaper in this region goes to downtown. Yeah? So you can clap, but the question you have to ask yourself is, that's a Ferrari, what are you doing with it? Yeah? What are you doing with that? You're, you're, we've, got, we've got people who are leaders in some of the largest corporates in this country, in our congregations. Very humbly sitting there, they're ushering, they're running children's ministry, they are doing good things. But the question I have is, what are we doing? We say we want to change culture. We're not changing these people. We're not having discipleship conversations with them. How do we ever think we'll ever become a culture-defining church, guys? So we have a Ferrari. This is the beauty of God. He's given us a huge trust. And we just need to shift our minds. And I believe as we shift our minds and we shift our hearts, God is going to do some tremendous things in our culture. Now listen to me. Some of you, you may be young. Masi Lenora, you're a young person. But God has put you, God has put you in a congregation where you're turning 33. That's young. Because God has put you in a congregation where you will disciple some significant leaders for this, this city and this nation. It's just the place he's put you. It's not, if you are not in that church, you would not have impact, influence in those people. But just because of where you are serving under Pastor Andrachi and Yvette, you will meet and influence and lead significant people who will change this country. Amen. So we need to stop sitting back and just driving ourselves to Naivas to buy vegetables <laughs> with our Ferrari. God has given us a tool that will change this world. Uh, Rwanda, where is Pastor Dennis? I mean, Pastor Dennis, you have a... Uh, you know, the thing about your church, your numbers may not be huge. But whenever I talk to your guys in church, I'm like, oh my God. Like every one of them has a, has a role that is, a, <laughs> like this guy leads some serious captains of industry in Rwanda. Like serious, serious people. That's your Ferrari. The question is, what are you and Natasha going to do in the lives of those people that will cause them to reproduce where God has planted them? And I believe as we begin to do this, guys, God is going to do some significant, exciting things. My exec team is on fire. They are passionate. They're looking at their church in different ways. 
they're seeing the opportunities that they never saw. By the way, me, I've had these people in my church and I've just looked at them. I didn't even care that they were there. I just thought, me, I'm here to preach the gospel. Oh my God, God, forgive me. Forgive me for misusing your Ferrari. We're going to have lunch um, and just do a prayer experience today. I want us to understand the prayer experience um, that we're going to go into. Tomorrow we'll come back. We'll continue this discipleship conversation. What, I, what my part is, every, after, every just before lunch, my part is just to help you understand some of the thinking that the exec team has been going through. Because God has been shifting a lot in our hearts and giving us new understanding that I don't want it to be, this is the exec that knows this. Uh, it, it's just a way to start percolating that so that you're all aware. Uh, we want to become that flat organization, by the way, where we send a, we send a WhatsApp of the, of the decisions exec reached, and in, in 10 minutes, the whole church has them. Because all our church is pastors, isn't it? Yeah. So I think we want to be that organization where information just flows in that way. So that's why you're hearing me. I want to just share all this stuff. Uh, what we want to do in the afternoon, we're going to do a prayer experience. And why that is important, we'll eat, we'll eat don't eat too much because you can't pray when your stomach is too full. But we want to pray some establishment prayers over this property. When we first moved to this property, it was a crazy, it was the hardest thing I've ever done in my whole life. Um, it was so hard to colonize. It was a barren, harsh landscape. Um, we used to have services here. People would walk into church, drive from Nairobi, and they'd get a headache when they enter the parking lot. Uh, they would walk, by the time they walked here, because we didn't even have a good cabro walkway, the women would be complaining that their pumps are now destroyed because of the bad land. I mean, this place was just hostile. People would have headaches. Uh, we had what we used to call the demon wind. Uh, the demon wind would just fly through the tent in the middle of a service. <laughs> and some of you remember trying to, you're running a Mizizi class and you're holding the tents down. Uh, it, used, it used to be horrible. People would go back to Nairobi and they would say, Hill City is far. It's so far. But it had nothing to do with how far it was. It was just because of how hostile the spiritual environment was. And so we had a chance to pray over this land. I remember once, once we had a fearless speaker who came, spoke uh, from UG. His name is Andrew Rugasira. He spoke and he came afterwards and he called Pastor Njoro and I and Pastor Simon and Pastor Milton. And he said, let me tell you why God sent me here. He didn't ask me to speak. He didn't call me to speak in fearless. As I spoke, I understood why. He said, there are spiritual principalities around you. And unless you take down those principalities, you will not be able to do what you want to do here. That day, God opened our eyes. Another speaker, Bishop Masika, Agnes Masika, uh, she called us and said, there are witch doctors. Huh? She even went a bit more down to earth. There are witch doctors around you, and they are doing things around you that you don't know. Discover what they are and break them. As we prayed, God led Pastor Simon to, to, to propose that we build an altar. Some of you are there at the staff retreat when we built that altar. That's where that came from. We built a physical uh, structure. And we call that our altar, and we prayed over this property. We went around the beacons, and we anointed those beacons with oil. And we just declared that this property belongs to the Most High God. Something changed. Like instantly, something changed on this property. All of a sudden, even the plants started growing. <laughs> like, the trees just shot up. You know, the place became, the air changed. By the way, since we prayed that prayer, I'd never seen a demon wind until last night, huh? Like I'd never seen a demon wind. The wind stopped blowing. The trees grew and became windbreaks. Somehow the place just changed. The comments we started getting on Facebook from first-time visitors were, what a beautiful place to come to church. I remember I used to laugh and be like, these guys have no clue what they're saying. Because that was the opposite testimony from what we used to have. So what we want to do today is just recognizing that uh, I had a chat with Pastor Njoro recently. He told me how they've had some significant spiritual attacks uh, as a team as a congregation uh, in this place. And because they're our... Then pray. Ah, okay. All right. Thank you. Because of... Pastor, um, I can share. I met Pastor Njero so frustrated, so, so in pain, wanting to resign, tired, 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 tired. He was like, Pasi, I've had it. This, he gave me a whole list of reasons why this is just not a good place to work. The crazy thing is I'd met his assistant, Pastor James, a week before. And Pastor James had given me the exact same speech with the exact same reasons that Pastor Njaro shared with me and told me he wanted to resign. 
And at that point, I, even I was like, have you guys plotted to resign together? Pastor Njero had no clue that I talked to Pastor James and that this was what Pastor James was going through at the time. And then Pastor Njero, as we talked, God just dropped a revelation. And I told him, what's the spiritual atmosphere at Hill City? And all of a sudden, Pastor Njero just paused and he said, oh my goodness, I see something that I haven't seen. He said, this place has been so hostile. He told me, by the way, we always knew the two witch doctors in this area. And he said, somehow, in fact, he had been told that a third witch doctor had been moved into the area. Reinforcement had been called. So now they ring the property on three, prop three directions. And he said that what has been happening in this place, actually, a couple, one, is it one of them? One of them has actually been spotted walking around our property. Kind of prayer walking our property. And how does Pastor Njero know this? Because our team in the Swahili service, they know those guys. And so guys just outed him and said, that guy is actually not here for good, good work. He's here for other reasons. Pastor Njero told me on two occasions, he had driven past with Pastor Miriam at night and found a guy weirdly dressed at our gate doing witch doctor things at the gate of Hill City. And I asked him, where were the security guards? He said, there was no guard in sight. And I wouldn't be surprised if our, our guard saw that guy and just took off. Uh, they knew he was, they were not going to argue with him. And so I told Pastor Njoro, but what did you do? And he said, I just drove home. Like, his alarm systems were just down. And I think it's just stuff he was going through. So he didn't even do anything about it because he didn't, he didn't even think, he didn't even think twice. Just like, oh, there's a witch doctor doing his spells. All right, let's go home. So, <laughs> So he, that's what he was telling. He was, now he was just confessing and saying, oh my God. And then he told me, all my team, when I've talked to them at one point or the other, every single team member of mine has come and told me how they want to resign because of how harsh and crazy this place is to work. And that's when we began to piece the dots together. And we said, my goodness, we need to pray because this is our headquarters. Yes. And this, there's a reason why God gave us this land for the sake of Mavuno. And if we don't pray over it, the enemy has plans for it. Already you can see what has happened in the property because we moved in. I take full credit, by the way, God's people. Because of Mavuno being here, that's why Great Wall is here. Yes. That's why these roads have been done. That's why the lights have come. That's why this place is what it is. This is a city on a hill. Uh, those of you who are new on the team, we can show you a picture of how it was five years ago, six years ago when we moved here. There was nothing, nothing at all. So I really believe that we need to pray. And today what we're going to do is uh, Pastor Njoro will lead us in some prayers. And we'll, we'll gather here. Actually, uh, I was told that you guys have just had tea break. So we can, we can postpone lunch for a few minutes. Uh, so what we'll do, amen. That's, when I hear, when I see some of the hungry guys, who usually hungry guys clapping, that's already, revival. <laughs> revival is in the house. <laughs> revival is already here. So what we'll do is we'll, 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 we'll take a quick, anybody who needs to run to the bathroom can do that. We'll gather, where do you want us to gather? Do you want us to gather? We'll, we'll just gather here. We'll take uh, two minutes, uh, anybody who needs to run to the bathroom break. Then we'll get a briefing. And what we'll do is some of us will pray at different places. We'll just break into groups, maybe networks, huh? What's the easiest way? We have divided into six groups. Oh, Pastor Njoro has already divided the groups. So you'll be shown where you'll go and pray. And some of us will pray in different corners of the property. Some of us will pray over the gate. Some of us will pray over the different places. Last night we had a demon wind again. I mean, we haven't had one in a long time. It destroyed our children's tent. Like... One of the watchmen was trying to describe what happened. He said, because it's, it's ringed. The children's tent has windbreaks all around it because the classes are around it. And the guy was saying the wind was in that space. Like, how does the wind come over buildings, come in, and then destroy a dome like this? Uh, and it just smashed the thing onto the ground. There's no place for that wind to... And the guy said even he couldn't understand what the wind was doing there. Because just like there was a concentration of wind in that one space. Now, we don't have tornadoes in this area. So I just, that's a demon wind. And so one of the things we want to do is put the enemy on notice. We're going to be taking back our territory. Yeah, because it's ours. So we're not going to be praying any begging prayers. We're just taking charge of the ground. Tomorrow, tomorrow, our, we'll still, we'll do prayer again. But tomorrow's will be an offensive action. So today, today, today what we're doing is we're defending. We're putting a, t a, a guard around our property in prayer. Tomorrow, we'll actually walk outside the property in prayer walks, in groups, and we'll go in different directions and just speak blessing over this neighborhood. We're going to just start already just declaring God's blessings over this neighborhood. We'll take a, an hour after lunch and just walk around and just speak. We'll send different SWAT teams uh, 
in different places. And you just walk in these guys. Don't pray in tongues loudly. <laughs> you walk in these guys and you just walk. And as you walk tomorrow, if the Lord gives you a word for somebody you meet or, or you want to pray for somebody, we're actually going to also do prayer, prayer SWAT. So if you meet somebody, you can ask. We'll give you permission to just ask the person, How, we are from Mavuno Church, we are doing a prayer walk. How can we pray for you? Uh, give us a prayer need. And then stop and just pray for them right there. So tomorrow is going to be a bit more on the edge. We're going to enter into the devil's territory and just... Because the Bible says the gates of hell shall not. That's not a defensive verse because it's the gates of hell that are, being, are trying to block the church and they can't prevail as we walk into that space. So, okay. So let me ask us all to stand. Okay. So what we'll do, don't go on bathroom break because we'll give instructions. Then as you go to your territory, as you go to your station, you can use the bathroom as your team is walking. Is that okay? Because otherwise we'll all go and then we'll all come back and it'll just be disruptive. So Pastor Njero will brief us on where we're going. Once he's told us where you're going, then if you need to run to the bathroom and then meet your team uh, where they're supposed to be praying. Uh, do you have anointing oil? Uh, we're going to have anointing oil. You know, some of you, group. We're, we're getting to a place where people will just be carrying their own anointing oil in the pocket. <laughs> I mean, what is this about waiting for it? It's yeah. just like, your anointing oil, here it is. You know, so uh, just give us a brief about where we're going. and then after Awesome. That we'll just As you're away. standing up, can we honor our senior pastor, Pastor Moretti? Thank you. Come on now, come on now, come on now. Let's celebrate the man of God. Thank you for the vision. We celebrate you, sir. You may have your seats for three minutes um, as I give you instructions, as, we, as I um, share uh, two scriptures just to anchor us and to know uh, what we need to do. Uh, you know, uh, when we were in our group at the Hill City Network, uh, Pastor Ari sh shared something so powerful. Uh, and I believe it's almost like, you know, something that Worship Harvest uh, family believe that uh, a praying Christian is a strong Christian. A praying church is a strong church. And there is nothing that can stand against that kind of a church. Nothing will be impossible. They will be unstoppable. The things that God is going to do is going to be undeniable and controllable. And so uh, this is what we want to do today. We want to become that praying church. And so uh, we are going to marshal all the strength, anything, all the kind of weapons we have in Christ, and we are going to advance in the power of the Holy Spirit and declare that this territory, this property, this area belongs to the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. We're going to declare the Lordship of our Lord. And so uh, the first scripture I want us to read is 2 Corinthians chapter 10. It's a scripture that you all know. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, uh, verses 3. Um, I, I want you to have a notebook or maybe a phone uh, because I want you, these are the prayer points. Uh, you know, these are, uh, we didn't have time to really write like the prayer points, but even as I speak, uh, there are a couple of things um, that I want us to, uh, to note on how we need to pray. The Bible says we are human, but we don't wage war as humans do. In other words, what Pastor M was saying is that there are things that we are seeing in this campus and they are not just natural. We are not looking at things through our human eye. You know, we are telling the Lord to open up our spiritual eyes, to see with our spiritual eyes, to understand or have an awareness of the spiritual realities. And the discouragement, the despair, uh, you know, every time you are feeling like you're giving up, uh, yeah, ministry is hard, but there is another aspect where the enemy is camping around your house and he's just saying it can't be done. But today our eyes are open. It's not just about ministry being hard. It's because the enemy is fighting us. And so the Bible says we are, not, we are, we are human, but we are not waging war as humans do. But listen to verse 4. It says, we use God's mighty weapons. Somebody shout God's mighty weapons. We have weapons in God. Amen. We are not coming in our own power. We are not coming in our own might. We are coming with God's mighty weapons. Amen. And we have weapons of God's word. We are declaring the blood of Jesus. You know, because I believe when those guys were doing some things at the gate, they were actually maybe declaring some sacrifices they have done somewhere. Maybe they slaughtered a goat or a chicken or a cat. 
but we are declaring the ultimate sacrifice of the blood of Jesus over those tiny, small, demonic sacrifices. And we are saying, God, let your ultimate sacrifice of your blood triumph over any demonic sacrifice that these foolish witch doctors have put on our gate. And so we have weapons of God's word. We're going to declare the promises of God. We have the power of the blood of Jesus. You know, we're going to declare the name above all names to triumph. Any other name that is not belonging to God in Jesus' name. And we're going to lift up the name of Jesus. Why? The Bible says, when you shall lift me up, I'll draw men and women to me. So we're going to lift up the name of Jesus today. And so today we are going to use the weapon of the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. So the Bible says not worldly weapons. And it says to knock down the strongholds of human reasoning. So prayer point number one. Wherever you are going to go. You are going to knock down the strongholds of human reasoning. There are some strongholds in this area. There are people who have said that this area belongs to the stronghold of immorality. The enemy has said. That this area belongs to immorality. This area belongs to witchcraft. That's another stronghold that you're going to tear down. So you're going to tear down the stronghold of witchcraft. You're going to tear down the stronghold of immorality. You're going to tear down the stronghold of death. One of the things you need to understand that many churches are actually experiencing spiritual death. Actually, from all the way, maybe from Sokim, it's hard. Actually, from maybe Mololongo, it's hard to see a growing church. Because there is just this stagnation and spiritual death. And so we are going to pray against the stronghold of spiritual death, but also physical death. But one thing also is there is another stronghold of stagnation. Businesses are struggling. Churches are struggling. Marriages and families are struggling. You drive from here all the way as if you're going all the way to Machakos. You're going to see a stronghold of stagnation. Another stronghold is a stronghold of division and, and disunity. It's so hard for churches to come together and unite around a common goal and work together. There is a lot of disunity and a lot of division. And so you're going to tear down. And guess what? When I'm saying about churches, it's not even about Mavuno working with redeemed church. Even Christians fighting against one another. Come on now. Are you understanding? So maybe when I'm talking about churches not working together, you're like, oh, maybe it's about Mavuno working with redeemed. I'm talking even believers. They don't want to work together around a common goal. And I suspect... Our senior pastor, Pastor M, that's why it's been so hard even to cast vision here. Because almost everyone has an independent spirit like Kwani. But today we're going to tear down that stronghold of division and disunity. And we're going to speak oneness in Jesus' name. Amen? So it continues to say, you know, strongholds of human uh, reasoning and destroy false arguments. Now, this is what I mean with false arguments. Today, by the power of God and by the, by the power of the name of Jesus, we are going to renounce every negative word that has ever been spoken against Mavuno. Okay. Some of you don't know. You, maybe you are new. We have been called names. We have been called Illuminati. We have been called, I don't know, a cult. I don't know for what. Even known preachers and pastors and church leaders have stood up and cast Mavuno. But as I read the Bible, that's a false argument. Because we know who we believe. And we know the mission and the vision God has given us. And so today you are going to pray. If there is anyone around this area who has spoken negatively against us, you are going to renounce those curses and turn them into blessing. Where there has been death, we are going to proclaim life. Where people have spoken destruction, we're going to declare, God, you're going to restore and rebuild. Where they have spoken death, we're going to speak revival. Tell your neighbor false arguments. So whatever false arguments that are in this area, that people have said, that's that church, that church. Because sometimes even when we do whatever we are doing, and maybe someone goes and says, oh, I go to that church. And then someone says, oh, you know, that church I've heard. Today we shall arrest every false argument. We shall arrest it. And today we are going to pray, Father, speak on our behalf. 
and remove those negative words. We are going to remove the arrows behind our backs where people have said pastors will never go anywhere in this church. We are going to remove that. And today we are going to speak life in Jesus' name. And then he continues in verse 5. We destroy every proud obstacle that keeps people from knowing God. There are some obstacles that are against people from, uh, keeping people from knowing God. Let me just uh, uh, shout a couple of them over here. Those obstacles we want to tear down. Number one, and the biggest religion. Religion in this area. That there are so many people who, yes, they have been Christians, but they don't want to go to the next level of having a relationship with God. And so we are going to tear down the obstacle and we're going to bind the spirit of religion in this area. We are going to bind uh, the spirit of unbelief. Those are some of the obstacles in this area. We're going to come against any obstacle against families. One of the things that you can ask uh, the staff at Hill City, you know, almost every week, every week, I have a text of a couple that wants to divorce. Almost, I can tell you, almost every week. Almost every week. There even there is a week I can have like three or four. I'm like, God, what is going on? Because there are some things that are against the family. Because the devil knows if families are going to thrive, you know, then we have a community. And because of that oneness and love, we can, all, we can become everything that God wants us to be. But if families are going to disagree, then it's going to tear down the community because communities are made up of families. Amen? And so we're going to come against any obstacle uh, around this area. Prayerlessness, those are some of the things that, you know, as I speak to pastors around this area, there is just this spirit of heaviness and prayerlessness, you know, among the churches. Because listen to me, guys, maybe let me put a kingdom perspective into this prayer. The prayer that we're making for Mavuno, and I think I've told several people, the prayers we make for Mavuno are not for us only. There is a pastor who needs your proclamations today. The prayers we're going to make today, maybe there is another pastor who is going to start experiencing revival because of us praying in this area. And so as you declare and you bring down those obstacles, another church, I believe, is going to see results this Sunday. And even Mavuno Hill City will start experiencing God's move. Amen? And then the Bible says we capture their rebellious thoughts, and teach them to obey Christ. We capture any rebellious thoughts. Today we're going to bring into God's, you know, a, a submission. Any rebellious thoughts that is against God. One of the things, I don't know, to some of you maybe have driven in this area, you're seeing a lot of wines and spirits popping up like popcorn everywhere. And today we are saying, you know, whatever rebellious thought or idea or any rebellious demonic agenda in this area, today we are going to demolish those demonic agendas in Jesus' name. Okay, I'm not hearing you. Do you believe that the enemy is planning on how to continue, you know, messing up and destroying this community? And today, you may never know, but today you're going to declare any demonic agenda of the enemy against the people of this area and against this church called Mavuno Hill City, we destroy in Jesus' name. Whether we know or we don't know, whether they're going to happen this time or whatever demonic agenda, because God knows, we're going to destroy in Jesus' name. Any demonic thoughts, any rebellious thoughts, we're going to bring them into submission of our Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, today, we are going to commit Mavuno Hill City. We are going to commit this area to the Lordship of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let me read a final scripture. It's a story you all know. But the last thing I want you guys to do as you go to your prayer point is that I want us to declare the presence of God. I want us to declare the presence of God. The Bible says in the book of 2nd, Samuel, chapter 6, I have no, I don't know if it is chapter 6, no, I think first uh, Samuel, is it first Samuel? Oh my goodness. Okay, there is a story about uh, the presence of God and Dagon, it's which chapter? First Samuel chapter 6, right? 
First Samuel chapter 4. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Pastor King. First Samuel chapter 4. Yes. So the Bible says about the Philistines captured the Ark of the Covenant. They were so happy because they recognized, you know, this is the one thing that is making these people uh, to be victorious. And so they, 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 they come, actually it's chapter 5, and so they, they take the Ark of the Covenant, which represented, you know, the presence of God, and they take the, the Ark of the Covenant to, their temp, to the temple of Dagon, their God. And they were like, you know, we want to reinforce our powers. We want to reinforce our might by even having the God of Israel in, a, in the temple of our God. Little did they know what they were doing. And so they put the Ark of the Covenant into the temple of Dagon. And the Bible says uh, in verses um, uh, 2, they carried the Ark of God into the temple of Dagon, placed it beside an idol of Dagon. But when the citizens of Ashdod went to see the next morning, Dagon had fallen with his face to the ground in front of the Ark of the Lord. I can hear the voice of every witch doctor, every sorcerer falling down because of the presence of the Almighty God. Pastor Moses prayed a very powerful prayer and said, in three months, either those witch doctors get saved or they die. Okay. Either they get saved or they, <laughs> or they leave. Okay, Pastor Moses will be merciful. Let's lie to the third one. They leave. But why are we exporting trouble? Yeah, they're going to disturb someone. So get saved or die. <laughs> this is the power of the presence of God. They woke up and they found Dagon falling with his face to the ground in front of the ark of the Lord. But people are stubborn. They thought it was a joke. It was a fluke. Maybe only for that day. And the Bible says, so they took Dagon and put him in his place again. Again. Verse 4. But the next morning, the same thing happened. Dagon had fallen face down before the ark of the Lord again. But the power of God this time around, the Bible says, this time his head and hands had broken off. And the Bible is actually showing us head represents authority. The hands, the capacities, the competencies, like I'm going to just cut you into pieces. No authority, no power to do the things you need to do. I'm going to cut you into pieces. Down there, broken off and were lying in the doorway. Only the trunk of his body was left intact. And that is why to this day, neither the priest of Dagon nor anyone who enters the temple of Dagon in Ashdod will step on his, on his threshold. And then the Bible continues to say about how the Lord just brought a plague into the city because they messed up with the wrong thing, the presence of God. And today what we are going to do today is we are going to declare the presence of God. We are going to declare the presence of God upon this church. That because of the presence of God, the Chinese gods they have put on this development on my right, is they'll start bowing down today, this afternoon, in Jesus' name. They'll actually start feeling something unusual. And I'm not speaking for the sake of speaking. That even right now, they are starting to feel the trembling of the power of God even as we speak. The gods are starting to bow down in Jesus' name. Things are starting to tear down that have been opposing the move of God in this place in Jesus' name. I can feel the demonic altars falling down and the demonic oracles being silenced in the name of Jesus because you're going to declare the presence of the Almighty God in this place. You read the Bible and see what the presence of God does. And that's why Moses said, don't give me an angel. I need your presence. There are moments where you can say, God, I need the ministry of the angels. But there are moments where you're like, don't send angels. I need your presence. We need his glory. And this is what we're going to do. Wherever you're going to go, wherever we're going to send you, we'll send you and just declare the presence of the Almighty God. And then after finishing the prayer, we're going to come and we'll all congregate at the altar. 
And this is what's going to happen at the altar. When we dedicated that altar, we dedicated it as an altar of Mavuno Church. But today we are going to rededicate that altar and say, this is the Mavuno movement in Jesus' name. And the oil we're going to pour on that altar is the anointing oil of apostolic grace upon it. Because a couple of years ago, we dedicated it as a, as a church. I said, God, we are dedicating this altar as Mavuno Church. But today, we want to dedicate an apostolic grace and anointing upon that altar. Let me tell you what's going to happen. The moment we pour that apostolic oil on that altar, Acts 19, actually, let me just say, we're going to see the, 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 the miracles of the book of Acts where an apostle Paul will go to a city and even Susaras will start getting saved, will start, you know, complaining because there is no business. People are not going to the witch doctors anymore. But people are not turning to the church. And I'm telling you, this weekend, this weekend, there are people who have never gone to church in this area who will flock in this church. I have faith that this weekend will have people who have never gone to church come. Because that grace, the presence of God, will start attracting people. And so that's what we're going to do after praying in our different spaces. So group number one, where we're going to go to the gate. The Bible says in the book of Psalms, I don't have that scripture, so allow me just to uh, quote it. The Bible says, open the, the gates and let the king of glory come in. And what we're going to do in Psalms 24, I believe, we're going to go to the gate. And we are going to close anything. We are going to close the doors to anything that is not of God in Jesus' name. We are going to declare that nobody who has a demonic agenda will come in through those gates. But today we are going to also open the gates for the King of Glory to come in. And not just for Mavuno Hill City, it's for the movement in Jesus' name. As we are opening the gates of this headquarters, we are opening the gates of Addis. We are opening the gates of Kigali. We are opening the gates of Bunjumbura. We are opening the gates of Kampala. We are opening the gates of Oyakiwe. We are opening the gates of Lifeway. Because this is the headquarters. As we are opening the gates of the movement, we are opening the gates of Berlin in Jesus' name. And so as you are going to go to that gate, I don't want you to pray with a campus mindset. You are opening the gates of the movement. And you are saying, Father, welcome in Berlin. Welcome, Lord, in Lusaka and do things that only you, you can do. I want you, Lord, to come and heal and deliver. We want to see massive salvation in Jesus' name and outpouring of your spirit. And so this team that is going to go to the gate will be led by a guy who is called Anthony Joroge. And then, uh, and we're going to get uh, some oil. Aaron Mesigua, you're going to be in my team. I, uh, Agi Kirabo, Alex Luchedo, Angela Okulo, we're going to be together, yo. Uh, Annabelle Munga, Anne Marie, you're going to be at the gate. Uh, Ashley Mukoto, Barry Ndongo, Beatrice uh, 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 B3, you're going to be uh, uh, with us. Bati Skado, Beth Karafa, Betty Dorika, Bill Han Jao, Boran Kemani. Actually, as I'm calling you, just start going, by the way. Uh, 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 yes, actually, let me just pray and then we we'll release you. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you because I can sense the heavens are open and you're releasing divine heavenly boldness and courage to bring down strongholds to knock down Father Lord false arguments principalities that have been keeping people away from God Release a grace of prayer like never before. There's going to be a prophetic grace upon every one of us as we speak prophetically over the movement. Some of us will start seeing pictures. Some of us, my Father Lord, will hear the voice of God. Some of us, Lord, will start feeling burdens and will start either crying or whatever feeling 
because you're going to download your burdens in our hearts. So God, I want to thank you. I declare a spiritual authority like never before. We have never heard a spiritual authority that is going to call those things which are not as though they were. A spiritual authority that is going to command water to come out of a rock. A spiritual authority that is going to say, God, make a way where there seems to be no way. And believe you to do the undeniable, the uncontrollable. Lord, I refuse and I bind the spirit of prayerlessness. The spirit that comes to distract. The spirit, oh Lord, that comes to tell us that we are tired. Father, tonight we are fighting a war for our next generation, for our nations. For the movement that is going to change every sector of society. So Father, we bless you and we honor you in Jesus' name.